Chapter 23, Feeding Time While the giants were being captured, a tremendous bustle and hustle was going on back home in England. Every earth digger and mechanical contrivance in the country had been mobilized to dig the colossal hole in which the nine giants were to be permanently imprisoned. 10,000 men and 10,000 machines worked ceaselessly through the night under powerful arc lights, and the massive task was completed only just in time. The hole itself was about twice the size of a football field and 500 feet deep. The walls were perpendicular and engineers had calculated that there was no way a giant could escape once he was put in. Even if all nine giants were to stand on each other's shoulders, the topmost giant would still be some 50 feet from the top of the hole. The nine giant carrying helicopters hovered over the massive pit. The giants, one by one, were lowered to the floor. But they were still trussed up and now came the tricky business of releasing them from their bonds. Nobody wanted to go down and do this, because the moment a giant was freed, he would be sure to turn on the wretched person who had freed him and gobble him up. As usual, the BFG had the answer. I has told you before, he said. Giants is never eating giants, so I is going down and I shall untie them myself, before you can say Raph Jobinson. With thousands of fascinated spectators, including the Queen, peering down into the pit, the BFG was lowered on a rope. One by one, he released the giants. They stood up, stretched their stiffened limbs, and started leaping about in fury. Why is they putting us down here in this grub sludging hole? they shouted at the BFG. Because you is guzzling human beings, the BFG answered. I is always warning you not to do it and you is never taking the titchiest bit of notice. In that case, the flesh lump eater bellowed, I think we is guzzling you instead. The BFG grabbed the dangling rope and was hoisted out of the pit just in time. The great bulging sack he had brought back with him from giant country lay at the top of the pit. What's in there? The queen asked him. The BFG put an arm into the sack and pulled out a gigantic black and white striped object the size of a man. Snozcumbers, he cried. This is the repulsant Snozcumber, Magister, and that is all we is going to give these disgustive giants from now on. May I taste it? The queen asked. Don't, Magister, don't, cried the BFG. It is tasting of trog filth and pig squibble. With that, he tossed the Snozcumber down to the giants below. There's your supper he shouted. Have a munch on that! He fished out more snozcumbers from the sack and threw them down. The giants below howled and cursed. The BFG laughed. It serves them right, left, and center, he said. What will we feed them on when the snozcumbers are all used up? The queen asked him. They is never being used up, Magister, the BFG answered, smiling. I is also bringing in the sack a whole bungle of snozcumber plants, which I is giving, with your permission, to the royal gardener to put in the soil. Then we is having an everlasting supply of this repulsant food to feed these third lusty giants on. What a clever fellow you are, the queen said. You are not very well educated, but you are really nobody's fool. I can see that. Chapter 24 The Author Every country in the world that had in the past been visited by the foul man-eating giants sent telegrams of congratulations and thanks to the BFG and to Sophie. Kings and presidents and prime ministers and rulers of every kind showered the enormous giant and the little girl with compliments and thank yous, as well as all sorts of medals and presents. The ruler of India sent the BFG a magnificent elephant, the very thing he had been wishing for all his life. The king of Arabia sent them a camel each. The lama of Tibet sent them a llama each. Wellington sent them 100 pairs of wellies each. Panama sent them beautiful hats. The king of Sweden sent them a barrel full of sweet and sour pork. Jersey sent them pullovers. There is no end to the gratitude of the world. The queen herself gave orders that a special house with tremendous high ceilings and enormous doors should immediately be built in Windsor Great Park next to her own castle, for the BFG to live in, and a pretty little cottage was put up next door for Sophie. The BFG's house was to have a special dream storing room with hundreds of shelves in it where he could put his beloved bottles. 
What is more, he was given the title of the Royal Dream Blower. He was allowed to go galloping off to any place in England on any night of the year to blow his splendid fizz wizards in through the windows to sleeping children. And letters poured into his house by the million from children begging him to pay them a visit. Meanwhile, tourists from all over the globe came flocking to gaze down in wonder at the nine horrendous man-eating giants in the Great Pit. They came especially at feeding time, when the snozcumbers were being thrown down to them by the keeper, and it was a pleasure to listen to the howls and growls of horror coming up from the pit as the giants began to chew upon the filthiest tasting vegetable on earth. There was only one disaster. Three silly men who had drunk too much beer for lunch decided to climb over the high fence surrounding the pit, and of course they fell in. There were yells of delight from the giants below, followed by the crunching of bones. The head keeper immediately put up a big notice on the fence saying, It is forbidden to feed the giants. And after that, there were no more disasters. The BFG expressed a wish to learn how to speak properly, and Sophie herself, who loved him as she would a father, volunteered to give him lessons every day. She even taught him how to spell and to write sentences, and he turned out to be a splendid, intelligent pupil. In his spare time, he read books. He became a tremendous reader. He read all of Charles Dickens, whom he no longer called Dolls Chickens, and all of Shakespeare, and literally thousands of other books. He also started to write essays about his own past life. When Sophie read some of them, she said, These are very good. I think perhaps one day you could become a real writer. Oh, I would love that, cried the BFG. Do you think I could? I know you could. Sophie said. Why don't you start by writing a book about you and me? Very well, the BFG said. I'll give it a try. So he did. He worked hard on it, and in the end, he completed it. Rather shyly, he showed it to the queen. The queen read it aloud to her grandchildren. Then the queen said, I think we ought to get this book printed properly and published so that other children can read it. This was arranged, but because the BFG was a very modest giant, he wouldn't put his own name on it. He used somebody else's name instead. But where, you might ask, is this book that the BFG wrote? It's right here. You've just finished reading it.